All right, uh, welcome everyone. It is Tuesday, July 31st, 2018. Uh, this is the Kubernetes SIG release bi weekly meeting. I am your chairperson, uh, Jay Singer Dumars. I work at Google. And your other uh, co chair of Caleb Miles could not make it, so I'll be uh, running this meeting. If you want to follow the, uh, the agenda after the fact, um, I usually have a great bit.ly for it, but I don't know what the one is for this, so I'll try and figure that and uh, post it in the Slack channel. Uh, the full link is available in the Slack channel as needed and also in the chat. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get started on the uh, agenda. Um, first thing is that we need to talk about the SIG release charter. Uh, so tiers, uh, because the one we have is not in the new uh, template format, so we need to go through and do a diff and uh, get that sorted out. So um, I believe we need to get some volunteers on that uh, to, to work on that. So anybody feeling particularly excited about this? I know, Stephen, you did a lot of this work before, but that doesn't mean you need to continue doing it. Um, so myself and Tim uh, volunteered the first time around. I just have not gotten to actually copy and pasting a bunch of the stuff. Um, if someone wants to take it up instead, um, a lot of the information that is in the readme for the release team in SIG release uh, is pretty accurate and kind of just defines what's in scope for uh, not just the, the SIG release release team readme, but SIG release readme itself. Um, so I'll post that. Hold on. As a steering committee member, although I forget if I actually signed up to review your thing or not, I, I will tell you, like, we don't, <laughs> we don't necessarily want to spend a ton of time reading a lot of really detailed stuff either. The thing that makes our, makes our lives easiest and the reason we have this sort of newer, shorter template is we really kind of want to focus on what's your scope and make sure we have the right boundaries in between six for scope. Uh, like if you're going to go through the process of saying that all the different release team roles happen to be part of your SIGs governance, that sounds like it's going overboard to me. But if you consider like the release team effort is a sub project of the release SIG, that seems a little more appropriate. Yeah. So I think we've lazy consensus is that idea. So I think we just need to document it now. Okay. Yeah, that's correct. Consensus is <laughs> um, okay. I'm. I don't know if you're taking a call for volunteers. You want us to put our names there or what? But I'm. I'm willing to to stay involved. I've had quite a few things come up the last few weeks where somebody's pinged me and said, "Hey, you need to do X," and I sort of said, "Well, I'll bring that up in the SIG release meeting because it's clearly under the charter of SIG release." But I don't think it falls quite under my purview for the 112 release. So. I've got a list of things in the back of my head that I want to make sure get captured as things people are expecting of us. Okay. Um, I would love for you to be involved in that. I'm going to go ahead and put my name on that list as well because I've already done all the meta issues for the steering committee on, on those things. So I've been staring at a lot of these things and doing a lot of thinking about ways that we can uh, sort of pare this down. I think something Aaron mentioned is really true is that we want to have uh, it's succinct enough that somebody can quickly understand what our governance model is and, and doesn't need to go into the gory details. But on the other hand, uh, the, the sort of rule of law of the project is that the steering committee owns all power of the project except that which it explicitly delegates. So the, the SIG charter is a way in which part of that power is delegated out. So we need to be mindful of that. Yeah, it's true. SIG release especially, like I personally defer totally to the release lead's judgment when it comes to like the final say on something going in or not, or holding yeah. the release or not. Which uh, is, is so far worked, but we also, I mean, this is something we probably need to revisit at some point, like what are the checks and balances there? So, um, but right now the, the important thing is just to document the expectations we currently have. Um, okay, anything uh, else before we move on there? Cool. Uh, George, I see you're on the call, and the next item is yours to discuss uh, Kubernetes I.O. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, so with the recent spam attacks on the users list and stuff, Contribex is, is looking to close it down, and we started to think about different ways to automate stuff. 
And I notice when we do release updates, um, you guys posted the list, and then we have like a Twitter thing, and then we have like a Slack thing. Um, so I was hanging out with some of the fellows, and we're like, hey, we should automate this for SIG release and make them love us. Um, so we've integrated, so as a test, we integrated if this, then that, which is a third party service, just, just as a prototype. If we can monitor when Kubernetes releases um, things and then automatically have that post on discuss.io. And then from there, automatically post to a Twitter account that we're going to have that's more contributor related as opposed to end user related. And then perhaps also automatically post that to the Slack channel. Um, so as I was investigating, I also found that your release bot, Anna, Anna somebody, Anna tool. Anna go. Like Thank you. Anago. Yes. Anago has like a little flag that you all type and send to this mailing list. So um, I was thinking, uh, is there a way that I can like tie that all together to make um, Discuss be the one so or GitHub be the one source of truth? And then I, we auto generate that for you and then post it on whatever properties that you have. Um, but I don't know enough about the release process to know like, is this useful for you? Is this annoying? Um, is, is going around posting announcements everywhere? Like, is, well, that, is that useful for you, basically? I think it could be useful, definitely. And it's one of the questions in my mind right now. So we're actually going through today trying to do our alpha release mm -hmm. and trying to understand between two very old documents what the actual process is and mm -hmm. update it. And one of the, the late gaps clearly are just having gone through the documentation where we're not quite sure how it happens, but that triggering of events, we're not quite sure how that happens. So we're depending on what happens later today, we're going to try to observe document and then it would be a great time to talk about changes. And one of the old documents, I just actually pinged Paris like 15 minutes ago about this. Okay. The, one of the old documents said, get access to Kubernetes announce. And she said, actually, we don't have access to that. Neither so, I, yeah. I, I agree. So um, um, the, the old document said to do something to which nobody's quite sure how to actually get. So either there's magic plumbing in place or something. Mm -hmm. And we'll be looking to define that something and make it less magic. And a connection to discuss would be awesome. So we'll, we'll hopefully be pinging you okay. this week, but in the coming weeks as we cycle through this. OK. So what we've done is, because we need to make sure it works, but I can't make sure it works until you all actually release something, is we hooked it all up to a test account. So whenever you release, we'll be able to look to see what it is. And then we're kind of in the process of screenshotting and documenting things. So ideally, if you like it, I just want to turn around with a bunch of documented processes and be like, here you go. OK. So, and uh, that sounds good. And let me just double check the safety net. So say, um, say say we, we iterate and accidentally make a couple of alphas today. Are you going to automatically start sending out announcements yet or would just to your little test account to see? Uh, no. So what happens is now all those announcements go into a moderator queue. Okay. So like anything, like we're not, That's perfect. nothing automatically posts without a human saying, okay, until we figure out. Okay. It might at some point, so, but. FYI, you may get some triggers. <laughs> we, oh, that's, we'll, that's perfectly We will see awesome. what happens in the next yes. 4, 48 hours, depending on what happens. I would love to get triggers, actually. That would really help us out to figure out um, to do this. And then one thing we also want to do, just to let you know, is we can tie in other releases from around the ecosystem. So we'll be able to give users not just the So they'll be able to subscribe only to core releases if they want, or if they want related tools like Minikube and stuff, they'll be able to. And I... I don't know, that'll give users, I think, more granularity than just like signing up to an announce list or individual project lists. But we'll see how that goes. I just wanted to run the idea by you. That's, uh, that's good stuff, uh, George, because that, that has been problematic and the li very limited amount of people that can do writes to the, the announce list has been uh, a problem I run into myself. Yes, So I hear you. <laughs> so uh, we'll go ahead and prototype and and do that. I don't want to take up too much of your time, but thanks for having me. Great. All right. Um, let's move to features process reboots. Uh, PTAL. Uh, so basically, um, there's a few bullet points in here, but basically, uh, Stephen, uh, Augustus, and myself have been revisiting the features process yet again. We had a meeting with SigPM this morning to kind of get people to look at it, and we're going to try and schedule a working session. 
uh, and maybe get some more eyes on this, but essentially trying to solve for this, this problem we have about too many things in distributed places and things not tying back to caps and all this stuff that uh, I've railed endlessly on uh, about. Uh, and basically Steven has some ideas about automation. I have some ideas about process and hopefully in the middle we'll find uh, a way to tie all those things together. So um, what I did was uh, post a link in the agenda to the two different proposals um, and basically would ask people to take a look. Uh, some of you already have and thank you for that um, feedback already. But uh, this is something that is, I don't think it's an action item necessarily until we schedule the meeting to discuss this. But uh, Stephen, do you have thoughts on this? Hey, yeah. Um, so the, the general overarching feel is process bad right now. Let's fix process. Uh, but shifting that process requires, uh, I mean, one, there's some, some churn, as Tim was mentioning in the, in the previous meeting, um, around deciding where to go and how quickly we can go. And if we choose one thing, uh, how long it'll take to, to try to shift into a different process. Um, so I, I would say my, my proposal is heavily around how can we fix near term? Um, sorry for the slack things. Um, so how can we fix near term uh, by putting essentially a, a set of features triage labels around uh, the, the K features and uh, K, uh, KK uh, kind feature uh, issues. Um, and Chase's proposal is uh, definitely more uh, top level, uh, how do we do this on a, on a policy basis? Um, figuring out how to one, drive adoption into grading caps, uh, tie those caps into actual trackable units of work um, across the release cycles and uh, mostly have a have a means of visibility one for the uh the release team the marketing uh team and um and the sig sig leadership essentially across the release cycle so um none of those problems that we're we're solving well or uh non-manually right now um so so yeah we'll we'll we have to find a, a way to meet in the middle between those two proposals so definitely definitely please take a look and, and open for comments do either of these involve the use no. of spreadsheets? Uh, so my uh, yeah. So my proposal is is around. Wow, it's really painful trying to track features on a spreadsheet and uh, combing through issues several times through the release cycle. Um, so fixing that, if we can one add those feature labels for automation, turn on some sort of. Uh, a la milestone munger uh, type labels, uh, type uh, slash functions for the features repo and hopefully use those that set of labels to bubble up into what eventually might, what might be a dashboard or something uh, for people to get uh, quick visibility into it. But yeah, right now it's manual. I don't want it to be manual anymore. I'm gonna be seeding the, the, the features lead role and hopefully someone will be taking over and I kind of don't want that to be the same pain that they go through. So. Yes, all of that. Um, so again, folks, take a look at those proposal documents and uh, comment away and let us know what you see uh, in those documents. Um, moving right along, revisiting Milestone Munger. Sweet, let's get into some fireworks. Oh boy. Uh, Oh, host disabled screen sharing, right. I'm, I could share some really violent stuff here. I think I have all the, the necessary links in the notes anyway. Um, so basically, the, the milestone, all right. So top level, I want Munch GitHub to go away forever and ever. There are three big things that are in my way for that. One, the milestone maintainer muncher. Two, the cherry pick stuff. Three, the submit queue. The submit queue is being worked on. Let's not talk about that. Cherry pick, I, if we have time at the end of the meeting, I can talk about that. Milestone maintainer. Uh, milestone maintainer is this thing that sweeps around like every day and checks whether or not your issue has one, one of three kind labels, two, one of four different priority labels. Nope, sorry, three different priority labels. Uh, three, any SIG label. Um, and then 
after some amount of time, it will remove the issue from the currently configured milestone if those criteria aren't set. Uh, then, once you flip a, a flag and we redeploy Munge GitHub, it starts yelling at you if there's no status approved for milestone label. Uh, and then I think when we flip another flag, it starts yelling you if there isn't also a status in progress label. Uh, it will also post comments if all of those criteria are satisfied, helpfully letting you know that it has swept through all of the issues that you could potentially receive notifications for and checked them and sent you a bunch of notifications about that. Uh, please stop me if I'm like mischaracterizing the way that it spams, but I think that's, that's the level of spam I've heard frustrations about. Okay, so why did we have all this status stuff in place? Like, what's the deal with that? So uh, way back, I think in the 1.7 release timeframe, whenever Don Chen was leading uh, the release process, uh, we had this problem where people would sneak their code into the milestone without anybody really noticing, because a lot of developers did and still do have direct write access to the repo. So those privileged few who have direct write access to the repo can just ping set the milestone on their pull request and then it would kind of slip on by. So we added the ability to gate pull requests from merging unless they also had this status label that was gonna be gated on membership of a much smaller group, the milestone maintainers group that I think we're gonna have a, a discussion about. Um, that's actually what that group was for originally, was to help maintain all those status labels. Uh, today, we have a milestone command, so people can add the milestone without being a member, without having direct write access to the repo, and that milestone command is in fact gated to the same group. But people could still like sneak their milestone in. So conceivably, we might still want that status label as that extra gate or that extra check that people aren't sneaking their work into the milestone during code slush and during code freeze when we're trying to be really mindful of what code is in there. Personally, I think all the status stuff is way too much noise and I would like for it to go away entirely, but that's, that's just my thing. And honestly, I think the whole milestone maintainer thing was a ton of noise and I'm not sure how helpful it's been. Like going through and reading the issue triage handbook, I've seen that the issue triage person seems to be running queries themselves manually to go check for issues that have all the labels, issues that might have been kicked out accidentally, issues that might need some of the labels. And so it's unclear to me what value the bot's providing. And I just wanted to have a group with uh, a discussion with this group of former and current release leads, the possible former release issue triage folks, uh, to see what we think about that. I have lots of opinions, but I'm gonna wait. Well, I've written up my thoughts rather extensively on the linked issue. Um, the, um, uh, as you can see from that, I find a limited subset of what the milestone Munger does to be useful and most of what it does not to be useful. Okay. So to sum up, I think what I see your useful functionality as you like that if those three label criteria that I laid out at the beginning, kind priority SIG, um, aren't met within a certain time within a certain interval that the issue is removed from the milestone. Yeah. That's the only thing you like about it. Well, and, and there's some other criteria, like if something is life cycle stale, it should be removed from the milestone. But, but we don't, it doesn't do that today. No, right? it doesn't do that. And that's trying to talk about like the thing today, like is there any part of it that we need to bother porting over or would anybody mind terribly if we just shut it off? The other thing that I like that it does is it has a time lag, so there's a grace period. The Not that the nags are proving effective, but the idea that, hey, we're pinging for some more information because we genuinely want it. We don't, our goal isn't just to remove things from the milestone. So that that feedback loop is still something that I would be looking to enable. Now, when you say time lag, can you elaborate what's the time lag from what? It's complicated. <laughs> There's this huge document that describes it, but the, the code basically goes through at a certain interval scanning, and then based on things that are found to not be matching whatever the current criteria is for the phase of the process, waits anywhere from 24, a day to seven days before it ejects the issue. Right. So my... 
my counter argument is the fact that you just had to start with it's really complicated means that it's yeah. too difficult to describe this to the general public at large. And I, I don't like the current implementation for sure, but I like the abstract idea that I'm, I'm requesting information and giving you some time to respond. Okay, so. I think we uh, could simplify those rules. Like here's an example of a simplification of those rules that we could put in place today. Um, the same uh, commenter, there's a, like a commenter utility we have, right? That you give it a GitHub query and then you give it um, an updated threshold. So time since the thing was last touched by a human being, and then you give it a comment template. Uh, and that's what we use to implement. That's what Fedabot is. Like it, it is a set of three jobs that run periodically that look for GitHub issues or pull requests that match certain label criteria, and then it applies a, a comment. Um, and so we could write something that like doesn't have any of our fancy kind labels and doesn't have any of our priority labels and is in the current milestone. Um, and if it hasn't been updated within n days, then it uh, issues a slash remove milestone uh, thing in its comment. And it could post in at a comment like uh, the fact that it's doing so. It can't be really smart and give specific logic about why it's making that decision. But um, I find it's maybe, I, I don't know, This I'm an engineer, so I don't know. Um, but it seems a lot more clear and intuitive to me if you're just looking at what look kind of like cron jobs with GitHub issue queries that I can run myself to see when does this run? And how long do I have before it gets kicked out? Now, admittedly, to Tim's point about these thresholds changing during different phases of the release cycle, like you would have to change how often this runs, or you would have to change that interval at each phase of the life cycle. But uh, um, that, that's actually uh, what we do now. We actually push a change to the configuration of the milestone munger every time we change phases. Right. So can we? Just for a second, step back here and, and revisit what, why any of this even matters in the first place. That was so, the other, just yes, please do that. So having been through this rodeo as both the rodeo clown being gored by bulls and uh, also being on the bull itself, uh, um, I'm gonna make some, some observations that I, that are this, all my POV. Um, issues in the milestone don't matter until code freeze, period. There's no, there's no reason to know. The, the whole reason that we have an issue in the milestone at all is to purely know, is there something that is a known defect that is targeted for release in that milestone that we need to either remediate, document, or, or, uh, or I guess those two things, either remediate, fix it, it's fixed, uh, or it's documented as a known bug and is gonna be fixed in the point release. Like literally that's the use case. And so it, uh, the, whole, the whole rigmarole around this ahead of code freeze is relatively pointless. Now what happens is the, the, the fire drill starts when code freeze happens, there's an issue we don't know if it's actually release impacting or if it's a flake um, or some other thing. And then we have to figure out how to chase it down, who owns it, what is the deal with this thing, like the, that whole that whole process of trying to find that begins with the SIG label. Uh, it begins with a priority. So hopefully it's been classified a, as a priority that, that indicates the true impact on the release because that's really what the priority is all about. Um, and then hopefully somebody's commenting and, I, and making people know that it's actually being worked, right? So we want to understand, is it real or not? Yes, no. Is it in the milestone? Yes, no. Is it uh, going to be fixed before the release? Yes, no. If no, then documents equal true. Or it gets, at worst case, the, the release lead can say, I don't feel comfortable with this going out with the release at all, and I'm actually going to go through the laborious, tedious process of reverting this code uh, if it's impacting and not able to be uh, shunted with a, a, a release flag. So there, there, I think that if we reverse engineer the process to say, what are we trying to accomplish? Then that drives out the requirements of the bot a lot more clearly than trying to say, where should we go with the bot we have, if that makes sense. So that's my, that's my two cents. I mean, in, yeah. in for, 
for PRs, like I said, the two things that we get out of a bot are number one, um, saving the release team some repetitive work in terms of if somebody put a PR in and, okay. it one sec, Josh. Soon and it's had zero activity in the last four weeks. Josh, can I interrupt for one second? I'm sorry. Yeah. So I wasn't talking about PRs at all. I was talking about issues. Right. And that's why I'm talking about PRs now. Okay. Because I have a whole different set of things around. Oh, okay. Okay. Why don't you, why don't you go ahead? Because I've written up a lot of my thoughts on PRs. If you yeah. I was, so I, issues have a really clear thing. I, so no, PRs are I just want to. An issue, so let's put it that way. And I just want to. So your description about issues maybe explains one part of the milestone maintainer logic that seemed weird to me where like it requires that the kind be either bug feature or cleanup. It yells at you if it's kind to anything else. That's what led me down this whole path is to, is to allow like our CI signal person to allow kind failing test or kind flake issues to be, be like, so that they don't get yelled at for doing that as part of their job. Um, so would kind, it sounds like kind failing test would probably be another special issue as we get in burned down. It, yeah. It's actually more, if you look at it, it's that if somebody posts an issue in it's kind design, we don't right. want the blocking release. Right. We also technically shouldn't be allowing feature as well, by the way, unless, see, this is, this is why I'm just telling you, like, I went into the code and I was like, huh, it's weird how this doesn't seem to be, the reasoning behind it isn't in the code. And I wanted to have a discussion with folks who've done this before, because I'm not sh I'm sure I could find three different documents of the truth. Um, yeah, no, that's, it should, but, I mean, again, going back to the spirit, all, our, job one, we have one job. Let's not release a Kubernetes with known defects that we could have caught if we just saw an issue that documented the thing and let us know what it was. That's the thing is that these, these issues are like, they're like a map, a treasure map with, except instead of treasure, it's landmines. So we need to make sure that we're not releasing a, a version of Kubernetes that has known defects in it that have, could have been avoided had we just seen the issue. Okay, I, I think that makes sense. And just to the other point you'd made, yeah, like I'm interested in this discussion being more about like, why did we set up this bot in the first place? And do we still find that the, those things useful or can we accomplish, can we fulfill those needs some other way? Um, I think right. the overall release team process is trying to do everything that the bot does as well, but manually. So I can, and I, the two feel redundant. And if I were to, to go with one option of manual versus automated, I would, bias automated, but in this case, the way it's noisy, it's proved to us that it's not effective and that the human one-on-one -on -one way gives you a lot more effectiveness because each one can be its own snowflake and you have to figure out and do some assessing and mental exercise there anyway. So and I, I don't think there would be significant risk if we just turned it off. Okay, but so that's, I think that's in the context of issues and I know Chase has a bunch more loaded up on uh, PRs, but uh, yes, I agree. I feel like the issue triage playbook is basically a list of queries you click and you run through every day as a human, which is kind of what the bot's doing too. All right, PRs. So PRs, uh, I believe firmly every PR that goes into a release should have a milestone attached. Um, from the get, because otherwise we have no idea what things are and there's no good way to actually see that. So starting with that as principle number one, that milestone should only be applied by somebody with the powers of the SIG um, and or owners or whoever whoever is qualified to say that. Um, and I, I, it's a little bit weird because if it gets merged to master, then it's ergo, it's in the release, whatever the next one is. So that could be automated um, just by date. So basically we have a start date of the release, which we call out anyway, but don't actually enforce. Um, and basically say that all PRs after X date cease, the, cease being the prior milestone and become the next or whatever that is. But bottom line is we need some DMARC in, in GitHub 
that forces things to be in one milestone or the other and not these sort of floating weird PRs with no particular context. Um, so the, uh, the period of time you're talking about where this matters would be code slush, is that right? No, literally before, like the, there's in between releases and then there's, I, I'm not sure when it's enforced or not, but I think it's like the entire yeah, release is that way. Yeah, it is currently only enforced during code slush and code freeze. Before code slush starts, you can merge stuff that has no milestone and actually no labels whatsoever. No sig, no nothing. Yeah, yep. which is not cool. And people do. So, I mean, it, it, uh, on the top level, it sounds like we need, a, you know, a, a behavior change, right? So it's it's not just it's not just a label fixing it's not and it's not just the rushing towards code code slush and code freeze around making sure that the labels are set properly it's making sure that the labels are set properly all the time. Yeah, if we had that because and that's what I actually said in my write up is that it'd be a lot less for milestone munger to do if this wasn't something we were selectively only enforcing during code slush and code freeze. But so why? This, my gut reaction is this is uh, increased developer friction. So um, let me tell you a little story about PRs I've seen go through. Two people get in a room and <laughs> one of them has merge privileges or write privileges. Uh, like literally there are people putting stuff in all the time with extremely low or no visibility. People, there's no enforcement on the approved LGTM coming from a different person. There's, this is like... So, but I'm trying to understand here. You're, I want to walk through a scenario where this is unacceptable prior to code slush. So people are merging in code. They're working on whatever. It sounds like you're saying, I'm not okay with people merging stuff into master. I need it to go through some kind of top-down enforcement that it's like traced to a feature somewhere. Well, what I'm saying is that the, the whole, like, just like your average startup environment, if somebody just goes in and starts monkeying with master and, and doing like one reviewer type uh, merges, and if they're over a size small, that, that's a huge red flag. That's like, that is, that is not acceptable. That's, I don't think there's any place that has a large code base that has that kind of acceptability for the most yeah. part. And I look at a lot of the PRs every week because of LWKD, and I'll tell you two things that I'm seeing in this realm. Number one is, Changes that are being made with no documentation of any kind. Yep. Um, and, and usually when that happens, those PRs also lack labels and release notes. Um, so that's number one. And then number two, what we see in the release team all the time is the release notes person having to spend a lot of extra effort tracking stuff down that should have been in the PR in the first place. <laughs> Yes, I understand these are all problems we've universally experienced. I'm trying to make sure we don't try to solve all the problems at once. Yeah. Um, I just, requiring uh, milestones up front. So requiring a milestone up front sounds an awful lot like what we tried to do way back when we required an issue uh, to be linked in the pull request description, which was something that there was much wailing and gnashing of teeth until we could find a way to just work around that with a prove no issue because ain't got no time to file an issue, right? Um, like, why so much friction? Like, so if I find about, something and I want to fix it, what additional process or what additional rocks must I carry in order for my itch to be scratched? So what about not requiring the milestone and having something automatically set the milestone when the release starts? Right, that way there's no friction up until the release point, and then there becomes a certain requirement as the release starts. I know we're constantly doing releases, but I, I guess I'm just like that seems uh, the same thing as if we weren't requiring the milestone at all. Yeah, the I mean, I guess one of the things that I'm really concerned about and concerned based on some of the stuff that I've seen, especially on code related to vendor specific stuff, is stuff code going in in which the ostensibly owning SIG is not involved in any way. Yeah. Yes. That is, code is, yes, that is a big problem. Right. Um, 
And so that's, like I said, that's kind of what the whole status approved for milestone label was originally intended for, to be gated by a group of people who were guaranteed to be, guaranteed to be representative from the SIG. But like today that has blossomed into a group of 70 plus people. And I'm not actually sure who in that group is from what SIG. Um, that's maybe kind of orthogonal. The other thing is we don't enforce a proof for milestone except during code freeze. Right, but it just sounds like you're telling me that from now on, forever and ever, I'm always going to have to go find a third person. On top of bugging my reviewer and my approver, I'm going to have to go bug somebody else from a SIG in order to make sure they apply yet another label to my pull request. Well, the SIG has to apply, or the SIG label has to be applied anyway, so it the, so in PRs, the, the, the milestone label is not precious. Uh, in issues, it is because it indicates a potential red, red flag for a release. The, they're totally different purposes. The, the, the milestone in, a, in the, the PR is to say, this code will be released uh, in this version. In the issue, it says, this issue pertains to this version. So totally different use cases for one. So if, if we want to just uh, apply the, the milestone to everything after X date, just to indicate that it's part of release, then that's, that's something that, that says in perpetuity that when you look at a, look at a, a, a piece of code, you can say, oh, this was version 1.8. Right now you have no guarantee. There's, you can pull up PRs and have no idea what version they're intended for or ever went out in. Like, that's not cool. Okay. I, I see your point on that. The, the Git nerd in me says, well, sure, you can take that and you can compare it to the range of commits from before the last milestone, before the last release was cut and the current release was cut and every commit in there, you know that's in this thing, but that's not, I'm clicking on a pull request and I see the milestone signified in there. And that I agree is something that automation could automatically help with. Yeah, that's, that's an easy case. And to understand um, that the two use cases are really different. PRs and issues are, are serve very, very different purposes in terms of, in terms of release signal. Uh, I honestly can't even remember if the milestone maintainer bot does this same nagging on PRs or not. It doesn't. It, well, the milestone, the milestone under once we're in code freeze and maybe in code slush, it requires the approved for milestone label, the status thing which I would like to get rid of and do some other way. Okay. Um, the, um, cause just cause for one thing, when you actually look at it, the idea that for three weeks out of the cycle, we're going to require approved for milestone when we don't require it at any other time. Um, it, it never seemed to make a lot of sense to me. But they're, they're different things. The approved for milestone in the issue means as a SIG, we expect that this is, this is a risk. And in the PR it says, we understand that, that code freeze has happened and we're, we want this code to go in regardless. Uh, yeah, I think that's what the milestone, it, it, originally like in code freeze, the milestone is the thing that says, yes, we want this to go in the milestone as part of a pull request, right? Code freeze is literally not merging anything unless it, into master unless it has a milestone applied. And so it used to be that we were using presence of a milestone as a gating factor. And the reason we added the additional status label was because any old joker with right access to the repo could set a milestone and get their code merged. And presumably by requiring the status label that only people who were SIG leads or people, I mean, people who were in this group who hopefully were SIG leads could apply. We were bottlenecking a little bit. I have a question. For Stephen and Jace, your your write ups that we we briefly touched on, asking that for please take a look. Do they cover proposed workflows around this type of stuff? Um, so, yeah, Jace is shaking his head. Mines does somewhat of a triage process, right? So the idea would be um, feature is well. Let me maybe pull it up. Um, uh, the idea is like a feature is. Uh, rather, a PR is submitted, it's marked as, uh, if it's marked as kind feature or, or some such, uh, then a bot comes by and does, hey, this needs triage, right? From that point, a SIG 
should come in and de determine whether that's accepted as a feature or something. But I, this is strictly for features, not actually issues that would be going into code. So, well, sorry. Yeah. Doesn't really solve this specific issue. Yeah. Also, Tim, to your point on me wants to say feature branches, uh, the um, server side apply uh, yes. group on API machinery is trying this, and we can find out how their experience is has yes, been with feature branches. I'm really curious to see that, and and it's also I, I say I throw feature branch out there as a phrase because people have heard that, but just branches and branch yeah. branches, it doesn't have to branches. Be. Sig Fu is letting me as a release lead know we're ready to merge our current work in a week's worth of chunk where we've gone and approved and it's a, a sane set of stuff it passes test as opposed to having to affirm every single feature the onus is on them to choose what they pull into their branch and whatever workflow they have but then they pass that up to the broader release and say this chunk of stuff is ready yeah that starts to look a lot more like the lieutenant model that you know other larger open source projects have used in the past. Um, but so uh, trying not to boil the ocean, I definitely recognize there are a lot of ongoing unsolved problems, but uh, I think really, Tim, you have the final say since you are the current release lead. I'm proposing that we just turn off the milestone munger entirely. Are you okay with that? I am okay with it, yeah. I think that the, the point of, I, I really view the release team as a set of people who are doing that risk management and the, the anecdotal sense I get and from others as well, I feel like is that that nagging just hasn't worked. I, I don't know, maybe maybe it's another release we, we rue the choice, but I, I don't feel like I'm seeing what we would miss from turning it off. So my ask as a stakeholder in this is that if we turn it off, there is some verbiage somewhere that says, how are we going to handle the specific use cases of managing quality from a, from a PR and issue standpoint? Like how are we, how are we managing those things? What, what is the actual thing that happens? Because we can't not do that. That is, that is simply not an option. That is, that is reckless. So. So I would agree with that. I mean, to me, it's like, are the current, do the roles as currently documented fulfill that need? So, so like my, my goal is to eventually like automate away every release team member's role. Right? Yeah. I, I, will, I will say some of the criteria about, you know, whether we kick out certain issues or PRs is pretty much whatever the munger does. So those would need to be written out explicitly, which would have been a good idea anyway. So as a thought experiment, let's say uh, two days before code release, or before uh, code freeze, I go in and I write an issue that has no labels, no milestone, nothing in it. And it says my experience with my cluster uh, using the code as is from master, I built my own, my own, my own version, tested it, has a critical defect that is going to cripple, you know, some massive part of functionality once it's out. What what is the process through which that is discovered and and actually brought to the release team's attention? Today we find that by the issue triage looking daily or multiple times a day late in the cycle at most recent opened issues and calling it out. It's fully manual. Okay. I I would also say the munger would not have found that anyway. Well, visibility and is, I mean, if it didn't have any labels on it at all, it would get nagged. And once you start adding labels, then it starts becoming more naggy, right? Because you, you so you add Sig, Sig Fu, now Sig Fu's got visibility of it. So Sig Fu looks at this thing and like, oh, that really is an issue. And then they label it. So it's basically that first level of visibility that needs to be added. So keep in mind, the milestone maintainer only does this crazy nagging on issues that are in the milestone. So the person's going to have to have to add their freshly opened issue to the milestone before it would get this nagging. And if it's in the milestone, I would expect the issue triage person who's doing their, uh, their daily queries or whatever to have picked this up. Yeah. I was in the impression that there was nagging also just for, for issues, generally speaking, that don't have a SIG label. 
So that is, a, that is a completely separate thing. There's a completely separate plugin, plugin called require SIG where yes, we as a project have mandated we want the SIG label on every single issue. Okay. But that comes in once at issue creation to my knowledge. So if, the, the per, if, if nobody saw it or re, the, the issue originator didn't respond to that message right there, it just sits there. Okay. Until DIMS comes along. <laughs> Is, is the merge also blocking on having a SIG label in place? No, uh, no it's not. And that would be doable. That's probably a gate that we need as well. 100%. Those, yeah. To me, I just want to have priority, priority SIG and, and a milestone. Like so that, well, so the merge is being blocked gets handled at a different level, right? No, but yeah, but I, like I could see a world where there's a thing, the require SIG plugin adds a do not merge SIG missing thing or something. Like we generally listen to do not merge labels. Yeah, I just right. like, it sounds like Jace is talking about improving our issue, our, our label hygiene cons or label consistency on all issues and all PRs, which I agree I want us to do. I don't think killing the miles to disabling the milestone maintainer prevents us from doing that. And I think that discussion could be better served by fleshing out what those requirements are. And then there's probably already automation that can get us most of the way there. And if we can start by building what's missing in the prow, then that, that's way less work than porting over the milestone. I, I feel comfortable based on the fact that those things are a manual process right now, as much as I hate to say that that we're not gonna get into a situation where we're releasing a known defect. That it feels like there's enough safeguards in place for that right now that that, that is the case within reason. So, so to, you know, Tim, you're the, you're the person who gets to say, and it sounds like you weighed in, and I just wanted to make sure that my concern of, of visibility was, was spoken to, which it has been, so. Yeah. And I, I have the same worry, because I, I think part of what you're expressing is the, the unknowns. Certainly we don't want to release, I mean, we, we individually look bad for releasing something that we knew was bad, but there is also still a significant gap here that we need to figure out how to iterate on to, to have less unknowns as well. Yeah, because I had, a, I mean, for 1.8, there was a black swan uh, uh, performance issue that came out there was an issue that was sitting out there. People knew about it, but they, they didn't raise it. Nobody wor worked it. It was just sitting there waiting to, to basically torpedo the release. So those are the things that are, that are scary. Okay, so. But, but that's not something that the Milestone Munger would discover in the first place. So I, I think by having, so back to the whole requiring a SIG label, if we can have some sort of process where require, like, requ one, it's blocked on merge without a SIG label. Two, by having the SIG label, you're also pinging someone from the SIG to actually do a review on that. Right? So not just that code section, but also a reviewer from the SIG. So that last part, like yeah. Yeah. labels don't ping people. You no. have to trust that people have the discipline to actually go query for their label. We've also tried GitHub teams, which seem to go off into the void. Like really, unfortunately, a uh, human contacting another human seems to be the only signal that's consistently paid attention to. So we'll get better at that. Um, I kind of wanted to cap us off here because we're well past 2.45. Um, I had something else in here about an end of life policy for older release jobs. I wanted to tie that into test infra's ongoing responsibilities, like how they already create um, release branches, why don't we have them tie that, like delete the old release branches at some time. This has never been a formal policy. It's been a thing that's been done ad hoc. That's why I wanted to get it documented. If you have any objections, raise it in that issue. And if we have any time where we want to stick around, Stephen, I feel like we talked a bunch about milestone maintainers in this discussion, or at least the motivation for why that team existed. Did we want to have any more discussion around that? I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm personally good. I, I have very little skin in the game as I don't manage the milestones actively. Um, I kind of put that issue up for just for review so people can shout out and we could collate the notes somewhere. Um, so that PR will probably get tossed, but um, we should at least use it or toss it up in a Google Doc somewhere so we can continue the discussion. Okay. Like, yeah, I know um, 
somewhere down the line here, we're getting a GitHub management sub project together as part of contributor experience. And we're going to drive, we're going to have the ability to, you know, set up teams based on a file. And we're hoping to see if we could use hierarchical teams. So I could see a world where there's like a milestone maintainers thing, and then sub teams under that for each different SIGs representative if we wanted to go that route. So you knew who you needed to ping specifically, who had the superpowers. Um, anyway. So how do you, uh, maybe not a question for this meeting, but how, how do you then from those hierarchical, hierarchical lists uh, pull out the right person? Because, uh, well, okay, all right. It'll be, it'll be viewable within that repo, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay, cool. Jace? Yes. That's your meeting. Um, pretty much that is all we got then, right? There was one more thing at the bottom, the doc. Oh, wait, that's the thing you got. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I, I think this has been a really good meeting, and I, I want to thank everybody for having the discussion around this stuff because it's, it's hard because fundamentally we're at the crux of developer workflow and release sanctity and I mean, we, we have a very high bar as far as the trust of our community goes, and I want to maintain that. So whatever we do, uh, we have to have that as the primary concern because, frankly, if we release shoddy code that we could have done better and that stops being used out in the world, then none of this matters. We have essentially torpedoed the project. So our most highest duty is to preserve visibility, transparency, and accountability um, across everything we do. So. I appreciate everybody having that spirit. It's, it's good. Um, so anybody else have any last minute things before we call it? All right. Great, everybody. Thanks so much. Uh, this, avail this recording will be available online in a bit if you want to share it with folks. And uh, I will see you in two weeks. I just remembered one thing. Oh. Um, the, <laughs> the date is coming still for um, KubeCon. And I don't know if we'll have another meeting, but do we want to do any sort of or pro coordinate proposing SIG deep dive stuff? We could probably do that on Slack, but just wanted to remind people yeah. that we have like a week and a half or something to do that. Uh, not, I don't know that anything's scheduled for China, but uh, I would love to do something in Seattle. Yeah, we passed the deadline for China. The deadline that's coming up is for Seattle. Oh, Seattle. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I think it's Hog 12 for Seattle. Seattle. Oh, oh boy. Okay. We're not, we're not doing anything for SIG release in China. I did propose a couple things. So we, we may at least have a placeholder in there and we could iterate if necessary then on my proposal. Okay. Great. Okay. I think we should and we'll hit it up in Slack. Thank you. All right. All right. Thanks everybody. Thanks Thank everybody. everybody.